everybody, and welcome to the Safety Wire podcast. This is an incredible episode that we're setting up here. Not only is it uh, the first time we've had a repeat guest, and not only is it the first time we're in London, but this is the first time we've ever conducted an in-person interview. Stay tuned. This is the Safety Wire podcast. Safety Wire Podcast. My name is Tim Wade and I'm your host. I am so excited to have Colin Russell here. Uh, we go back a ways. I have learned a ton over the past year and a half that I've known you and thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Great. It's great to have you over this side of the pond this time. I love it. It's, it's a chance for us to get together and talk rather than trying to do it on a screen. And you know, you've been here for a few days now and got around our operation and it's just brilliant to be able to have a chance to do this. I love it. I am equally excited. This is such an impressive operation here. You guys are right here on Farnborough Airport. We have an amazing backdrop. Uh, see some incredible aircraft moving through all the time. Uh, tell me a little bit about FlexJet's European operation and what you guys are doing over here. So, so FlexJet Europe started off a little while ago where they bought a small AOC and grown and turned it into the FlexJet brand. Really grew it, developed it, invested in the aircraft. So we've got an amazing fleet of aircraft we've got. Freighter 600s, we've got Gulfstream G650s, and we've now just got the Global XRS coming in. So we've got a great fleet of about 15 aircraft. We've also bought a helicopter company and they've merged that in. So we've now got, got um, Flexjet helicopters over here. So we've got one of the S76s, but we also have a number of managed aircraft. So we've got nine helicopters and 15 jets at the moment, but that's only the start. There's, there's a huge growth coming, but it's the interesting thing is it's not just about the number of aircraft, it's the complexity of operating in Europe. Mm -hmm. So we have two AOCs. We have the UK AOC, but we also have an AOC in Malta. Different regulators, different regulator environments, different priorities, etc. So you have to try and balance the blend of both of those. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a far more complex operation. So the aircraft numbers are low, but the complexity is really high. Are you seeing in any issues with uh, converging of regulations? or even cultures, or the way things are done differently across Europe, not just here in the UK? Well, <laughs> I mean, Christ, we've been like five minutes in and we're onto Brexit already. <laughs> Brexit threw a hand grenade into the way aviation is run in Europe. Okay. And I mean Europe as opposed to the European Union. Um, so, so by stepping out of the European Union and therefore outside of EASA, the European Aviation mm -hmm. Safety Agency, the CAA has always been very strong and they're fantastic. Mm -hmm. But there is a natural separation. So we're now a third country to Europe. Okay. To, to European aviation regulations, mm -hmm. which means we, we have a we have to have various boundaries, various firewalls in there, but also the regulations. The UK CAA took the European regulations, which they've helped develop, and just copied them into UK law. But over time, naturally, there will be some drift. So we do we haven't seen much of it yet, mm -hmm. but there is the potential for the regulations to start to move apart a little bit, or but or even just in implementation timelines and things like that. So so we have to be very careful and very conscious of making sure we have two sets of regulations, mm -hmm. two regulators, two sets of oversight to make sure that we, we don't drift across either. Correct. So it's a, it's a really complex and challenging, it's quite geeky, we're talking regulations and stuff, which you can tell is just not my passion, mm -hmm. but, but getting into that stuff just brings an added layer of complexity to the operation, which we have to be very careful of. Which adds an extra layer of risk to any operation. With us in the US, uh, I was with Constant Aviation at the time when Brexit was occurring, and it was like getting drip-fed information at the time, but it almost seemed rushed. It seemed like one day they were thinking about doing it, and almost like the next day it was done. Did it kind of feel like that over here, like it possibly wasn't thought out? Or it, was, it, was, it was difficult to think out, think, think ahead, mm -hmm. because no one knew what was going to be agreed. Mm -hmm. And then once it was agreed, there was a real pace to get it done. So, so even though it was actually like four or five years from when the... You know, the the vote came in to actually when it happened, there was a, an acceleration towards the timeline. Once people actually agreed what was it, it was going to be like, you then had quite a short implementation time. And that's why, so for example, we had to set up a Maltese AOC very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and we did it really well. I mean, we're very fortunate in how we did it. But it, what it meant was that brought pace, it brought, it brought a focus on that activity. Mm -hmm. So you had to then make sure that not only could you focus and resource that complex activity of setting up a whole AOC, but you also have to maintain the rest of the operation and keep oversight of that. Mm -hmm. So it's these things are challenges that come, uh, particularly in Europe, these regulatory challenges, size, scale, mm -hmm. scope, etc. It's, it's, it's exciting. I mm -hmm. mean, it's phenomenally exciting to grow and be part of an organization that's building and growing. But you have to be very cognizant of, of the trade-off of it. Mm -hmm. and, and that's that's exactly what we're doing. So so when you say, you know, talk tell me a little bit about FlexJet Europe, oh my God, yeah. it's 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 nuts. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Um but I think the best thing about it is the people. Yeah. 
um, the people will give you energy. You, you draw energy from the people you work with and they draw energy from you. But if you're all drawing towards the same kind of goal, the mm -hmm. same mindset, it's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's exactly what we're, we're incredibly lucky here, that we've got a bunch of passionate people who really want to be part of something awesome. Mm -hmm. and, and that's that's where we're at. And, and then you bring in the partnership with the US we have and, and the feed. And we also have Syria, our Italian partners as well, who are part of the family. And this family just, just thrives and supports each other. It's, it's that's just awesome. It is one of those incredible environments that we get to, you have a freedom to enhance the company. And that's what I love about this leadership style that we have here is everyone's pushing towards the same goal. Everyone has their own idea of how to get there, but there's a great passion, like you said, to push us towards that goal. You did mention one thing of how, uh, how you guys are dealing with Brexit and everyone's kind of waiting to see what was going to happen. I feel like we're experiencing the same type of issue in the U.S. with our SMS finalization. I think a lot of people didn't think it was going to happen that the final rule would come out and then it's on and you now have all of these uh, companies, all these 135s and 145s wondering, well, what are we supposed to do now? We didn't think it would ever take place. And now here we are kind of stuck with that. Yeah. And, and, and that's the same with any change in regulation and development. So they introduced safety management systems into part 21 mm -hmm. for design and, and manufacture and also into part 145 here relatively recently in Europe. So mm -hmm. the regulation came out a couple of years ago. Well, last year um, and with an implementation period. So that understanding of, well, what does it mean for us? And it's, it's happened to those that are slightly more remote from the risk. If you talk about flight operations or ground operations, the risk is very tangible, very present. Correct. When you start to move into, into maintenance, less some so, but when you move into design and production, the risk feels quite far away. Mm -hmm. It's not tangible. It's not, you can't feel it, touch it, taste it. Mm -hmm. And so that, what does this mean to us? It's harder to interpret. Yeah. So in my last role with Lilium, you know, trying to convince people that SMS, and they're like, but we do safety, we do safety and design. And like, yeah, you do, one time stand to the minus nine and all the certification stuff, it's phenomenal. There's a massive amount of work in that. So they're saying, but so why SMS? What, what does that do for us? And that's the biggest challenge is in, in this implementation bit is, what's the why in it? Mm -hmm. You know, what's, that, what's the driving reason behind doing this? Because if you can understand that, then you can start to work out, well, how are we going to do it? And what are we actually going to do? If you go back to you know, Simon Sinek's little circles, I love it. You know, mm -hmm. start with why. That's exactly it. Why has the regulator and why has ICAO even pushed for safety management to be implemented across the aviation environment, mm -hmm. the whole ecosystem? Because that's, that's the game. Mm -hmm. That's the ultimate aim. And, and various elements of it are slowly being added to the pile. For example, you've got part 145, you've got part 135 and part 191 guys. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got ground handling, FBOs. They, are they required to have, so you've got ISBAR and stuff, but you don't have, in Europe, we don't have a, a regulation for ground handling. That's coming in. We're just about to put it in, which will include safety management systems. So that's pretty much the last piece of the, of the jigsaw to go in for Europe, certainly. Mm -hmm. but, but this whole understanding of, well, how does it work? Yes. What, what is it? Okay. That's a bit of a good, why are we doing it? Mm -hmm. And, and so the example I used to use in a little with the design organization was like, okay, so calculation of the probability of a catastrophic failure, one times 10 to the minus nine, one in a thousand million. Great. The person that's doing that calculation, mm -hmm. what's affecting their ability to get the job right? Mm -hmm. Are they under significant time pressure? Do they have the right resources? Are they suffering from distraction? Are they suffering from fatigue? All those elements, those performance influencing factors have the impact of potentially meaning that calculation that says one times 10 to the minus nine might actually be incorrect. And the person checking it might also be in the same boat or might be relying on the fact that actually he's less competent than the guy who did the calculation. So if the guy who did the calculation says it's great, then he's not really checking it properly because that's human nature. So, so the safety management system in a design organization is not trying to replace the certification standard, the design safety element. It's trying to help the organization ensure that the outputs are safe. And, and that's, that's a fundamental mindset to get into. And a lot of organizations are, uh, are fighting or running away from it, are just not paying the attention to it because they haven't had a chance to understand why it's something that's being required. It's just seen as, oh, for God's sake, it's another thing I've got to do. Yeah. And I totally get that. I, I totally understand that bit. So, so that's really the part of the challenge is to go back to Simon Sinek. What's your why? Mm -hmm. Organizationally, what's your safety why? 
you know, if you can find that, then, then you've got a good chance that when you read the regulation or read all the requirements, you'll be able to put it in your own language. Too many operators, I think, are viewing it as all the regulatory bodies are just bored guys sitting in a room thinking stuff up. What's the next thing we can throw at these people to make them abide by, to cite them on, to charge them for? And I think they're not really realizing there is a greater why. It's a time-tested, proven solution to reduce risk and to manage safety in a different way. And, it, you know, for those of you listening, if you can't tell already, Colin, you have an, an amazing view on safety, more so than just a job or even a career. It's more of a philosophy to you. Where does that drive and view of safety really come from? Where's your determination that this is something that's a mentality and a philosophy for you? Uh, do you know what? That's a really, really hard question to answer because... It, it's something that builds over time. Okay. You're constantly influenced. Mm -hmm. And there are people that influence you positively, and there are people that you look at and you go, shit, I'm sure as hell not going to do it that way. <laughs> that, and, and that's where you build your, your knowledge, your passion, what inspires you. Um, I've had a number of people who I've, I've worked with who have absolutely inspired me. And they start off from, you know, I had a, my first ever squadron senior maintenance rating yeah paul darcy my god that man was a hard guy to work with but he was awesome and he taught me my trade as an engineer as an engineering officer mm -hmm. he was the guy that taught me to lead in an engineering context in a maintenance context mm -hmm. because he taught me the, the role of respect and he taught me the he taught me that ability as a young officer to listen to the guys around me and feed from them uh, and that that helped me in understand the real core leadership element of Listen to your team and care for your team. If you don't give a shit about your team, they sure as hell won't give a shit about whatever you're after. Mm -hmm. So, so that taught me that ability to engage the team and listen to the team and care and let them know that I cared for them. And, and that was so that was the first bit of safety. I didn't realize it was safety at the time. It was just being a good, a good bloke and being a good leader. And then I started to see some other bits that kicked in. And then I met Kevin Baines. Uh, Kevin Baines was the guy. He set up Bain Simmons along with Bob Simmons, so hence the Bain Simmons. But, but he, he was the one who, who brought to me human factors, error management, safety management, but not safety management systems. And that's the interesting, I'll come back to that in a second, but, but he brought that ability to, to show how we could do better, mm -hmm. how we could recognize the human in the system was one of his key phrases. It's not about the system, it's not about the human, it's about the human in the system. And if you get that bit, Actually, most of the things that go wrong aren't to do with the human. They're to do with the system and the interaction of the human and the system. That's where a leader goes fixing problems. Mm -hmm. it's, it's A, being able to recognize it and then getting off your ass and fixing it to help the guys have a better guys and girls have a better chance to get it right. That's, that was an inspiration for me. That's why I let, chose to leave the Navy to join Kevin and do what he did. And, and the team at Bain Simmons were inspirational because every person who was there where they were all about making a difference in aviation. Mm -hmm. and, and when you're in around a team of people like that, it just rubs off on you. Mm -hmm. You just get this sense of deep care for, for aviation and safety in aviation. We used to say that we'd never know whether we'd had an effect. Mm -hmm. But if one person made one decision differently, be it in a maintenance hangar, in a cockpit, in the, on, the, on the rack, wherever it might have been, that stopped an accident from happening, then all our jobs would have been worth it. Mm -hmm. That's quite a deep mindset. It's quite a deep yeah. why. If you come back to Simon Sinek's mm -hmm. why, that's a deep why. Uh, but that's what inspired us. So I took that and I built that working with companies and, and that allowed me to finesse some of my approach, but it mm -hmm. also allowed me to see the good, the bad and the ugly. Because I would meet people when I was consulting and I'd see some people who I'd go, you got it. And I'd see mm -hmm. others and go, yeah, I can understand why I'm here as a consultant. Mm -hmm. um, and there are others you just think, they just need to help understand it. And once they understand it in a different way or somebody explains it in a slightly different way, they're off on one and they were amazing. So you, you find all this good and bad and ugly. And that's kind of how, how I got my inspiration. But I also feed off people. Mm -hmm. um, I, love, I love the response you see and hear when people get it and they show an interest in it and they start to care. I mean, when you see the safety report, the way that the pilots or the ops guys engage with you and start to talk about a difference they've made or the cabin servers start telling you a story of something that happened to them previously and they see the difference here mm -hmm. and you know that you've made a small part of that difference and that positive approach they've got now it's really rewarding and that again that's where you get the pack so it's all people driven mm -hmm. i'm not i'm not driven by a safety management system i'm driven by caring for people mm -hmm. and if you care for people and you manage safety and you manage the operation safely, I choose my words really carefully there, you manage safety, 
you manage an operation safely. And a safety management system is a collection of tools. It's like a tool bag, mm -hmm. which has, you pull out the policy, you pull out the risk management process, you pull out the safety assurance process and, and tools, software, but it's just a tool bag sitting on the ground. That doesn't give, the tool bag doesn't give you, doesn't give you a new shed out in the garden. It's the people using the tools that give you the new shed in the garden or fix the aircraft or load the bags or whatever. It's the people. And that's where safety is. So SMS and regulation and all the stuff that's coming in, absolutely brilliant. But without people actually using it and understanding that it's just a tool bag and that in order to be safe and be safer and continue to improve, it's the people that count, then, then that's when it stagnates. Exactly. And you, you hit it perfectly of with the people because safety is a service industry. It's not a getting thanked every day industry because like you said, most people could go through an entire 30 year safety career and never know if they had an actual impact because most likely if it just runs just fine, you are having an impact. You just won't really know about that. That's it. You're going to know when things go wrong though, because they're going to ask you why to go wrong because they think safety keeps you safe but we don't, we're a resource and we guide and, uh, and help out with that. Now we've talked about leadership and how we are in safety and it's really easy for you and I to influence safety because we're at the director level or the VP level or yeah. you know, anybody who's in a safety role. What advice do you have for somebody who's not in a safety role, but they still want to seek influence into the safety department. They still want to seek influence into the safety culture of their organization. Where could they start? What could they do? So, so it's about networks and relationships. And that sounds pretty jargon. -y. It's about being able to have a chat with somebody. Mm -hmm. So if you've got an interest to either influence and build safety, or you've got concerns and you want to share them and you want to learn more, you know, they, people talk about the water cooler moment as, mm -hmm. a, as this sort of this thing, but it's true. And to me, just spending time with people, you know, I spend a lot of time with our pilots. That's really intentional because if I don't have a really good rapport with the pilot community, I can't do my job. And they also don't know how to do their job from a safety perspective. So I share with them. I sit with them. I, you know, I'll, I'll stay in the hotel near them. I'll go flying with them, whatever it is. I'll, I'll banter with them. I'll give them grief. I'll tell them that pilots forever break aircraft and engineers forever fix them. You know, and, and that kind of relationship, that trusting relationship you build means that when they've got questions, they feel approachable. They feel yeah. I'm approachable. So, so there's a role for both sides to have. One is to, is to take the effort to approach the safety team, to understand and learn a bit more, or, or to listen and observe them in, in action. But also there's, a, there's the safety team's responsibility to be approachable, mm -hmm. to be able to discuss what, we talked about this in the last podcast, about the language we use. Yeah. You know, if we use very technical jargon, then no one's going to approach us. Mm -hmm. gonna, we're going we're gonna to be find ourselves in a little room in a corner normally the broom cupboard where we're told to crack on and keep safety over there. Mm. If you become approachable and engageable yeah. and people want to chat with you, mm -hmm. then, then they want to learn and they, and they'll develop themselves in their own areas. Sure. Mm. So, so I think it's, it's, it's really to do with that. It's, mm. it's give them the, give them the confidence to approach you and be a, be approachable and be able to share it in their language. I would love to get to language here in, in a little bit, but uh, you touched on a great point of, uh, you know, for the safety teams listening, we need to cultivate an environment of trust where people can trust that their words are going to be listened to. And we're going to react to them, but also you do need to, as every employee and every employee should be, um, you know, given the, the ability to influence the safety team, you need to have that bravery to come to your safety department. Uh, you spoke of influence quite a bit. Um, has there been anybody in your career specifically, whether it was from a book you read or from someone you've interacted with personally, who has influenced you in your safety career? Yeah, so I mentioned Kevin Bain because yeah. he he set the culture at Bain Simmons. Mm -hmm. He was a very he, they used to refer to it as being the best squadron you've ever been on, okay. where no one ever got left behind. And I don't mean that in that sort of classic mm -hmm. American sense of we never leave any casualties and support people behind. But but if you're walking out of the office door and somebody's still working, what are you doing walking out of the office door? Mm -hmm. You don't leave somebody behind struggling because they might be really struggling with a bit of work they're trying to do. Mm -hmm. So you stop and you say, hey, how you doing? You okay? And if they say, yeah, no, I'm fine. Is it, you know, can I get you a cup of tea before I go? Mm -hmm. It takes you two minutes before you walk out that door to make that person a cup of tea. But that delivery of a cup of tea or coffee or whatever it might be, might just make the difference in that person de-stressing and getting the job done. So that's what I mean by you. And, mm -hmm. and that was one of the sort of mantras. It, that, that idea, we have a common purpose, that back to that mm -hmm. making a difference in safety. 
Um, you know, it, we used to say that safety was our passion and our profession. Mm -hmm. And it was very true. And, and so by looking after the team, by looking after each other, not leaving anyone behind, not leaving anyone struggling with their work whilst you were disappearing off home, created that bond with that sense of so that was a real influence to me. And that Kevin was someone who really explained to me getting the people element of safety. Yeah. Um, but also it, it showed me that if you're passionate about it, it doesn't matter where you sit in an organization. You'll be an informal or a formal leader, but mm -hmm. you'll be a leader if you're passionate, because passion comes shines through. There you go. Um, and and I'll never forget that somebody once referred Kevin, amazing guy. He was a corporate in the RAF. He he was a surveyor in the CAA. He left to set up his own business, built his own business from literally him and Bob together to a really world respected safety consultancy. And I once heard someone when I because he was doing a lot of work for me, he said, "Oh, that's the ex corporal." And I looked, and, and you know what? It, it didn't make Kevin any lower in my standing. It made Kevin higher in my eyes, mm -hmm. but it made the person who said that lower in my eyes mm -hmm. because they were equating a position, a hierarchy mm -hmm. with influence. And it's not. Yeah. It's about this. Exactly. And if you've got a passion, if you've got something in here, you can influence the world, even if you haven't got a formal title. Mm -hmm. And that's back to that safety role, that, that ability for safety professionals. Mm -hmm. If you have a passion and you understand that you... You can get out there, you can share positive stories and you can help develop people and show you care. It doesn't matter what what the formal structure and what hierarchy safety sits in an organization. People will want to listen to you and they'll want to listen to the things you've got to say. Exactly. So so that's the, mm -hmm. that to me is so so I, I'm not a believer in hierarchy. I mean, I'm walking around in jeans and trainers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't walk around in a suit. Okay, not that we, we all wear suits mm -hmm. there anyway, but but I you move up and down the layers as you yeah. need. Um, and that, to me, is a great way of showing you've got soft influence. Mm -hmm. You've got you've got the ability to inspire, encourage, but you've also got the ability to challenge. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that classic, you know, walking on by thing. If you're a safety professional and you see something that's not right, you can't walk by it. Because if anybody sees you walk by something that's not right, it undermines you. And it undermines your credibility. It undermines that influence you have. So the whole role of a safety professional is an influencer. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, you know, we're sitting here with podcasts. <laughs> My God, you should see the setup on the other side of the screen, on the other side of the table here. We've got three cameras, microphones, everything going on. And it's awesome. And I fit uh, it on a carry on. <laughs> yeah. And, but the, the whole issue with this is when we talk about influencers and we see the influences of social media, of, of icons, celebrities, etc. Why? How do they influence people? Mm -hmm. They influence because... Because people want to hear what they have to say and take heed of what they have to say or what they're selling. or That's why people pay them, because people take heed of what they're trying to sell. Mm -hmm. It's no different to what we do in a safety role. You talk about that advisory role, that almost consultancy role. Mm -hmm. That's our job. Mm -hmm. Our job, there's paperwork and there's process and there's risk assessments and all the audits and all the other stuff we do. But that doesn't mean anything unless we actually can influence the outcomes and get support and influence others to support the outcomes. So, so safe, you could almost call us safety influencers. <laughs> you know, people talk about safety officers and all these different roles. You're, you're a safety influencer. And I say that to a guy who's pretty phobic about any kind of social media other than LinkedIn. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, very, very true. You know, and I, I think you and I can talk passion for, for days because that is what drives us, you know, because you're going to have crap days in safety. You're going to see the worst of the worst come to the organization. Uh, and that's usually what is in your feed is what has gone wrong, never what has gone well. Uh, and to keep that passion alive usually comes back to those of us who share that same passion, how we want better for our organization, we want better for our people. Uh, one thing you and I have talked about extensively this week is the language of safety. And you have greatly influenced um, how I view the things I'm saying, especially when it comes to uh, investigations and interviews and saying that there was a failure somewhere. Um, what's some of the language that you take an issue with right now in safety and uh, what should be better tools that we should be really be using when it comes down to um, incident investigations and things like that? And I know incident investigation already has a negative connotation to it. So people immediately get turned off when they hear investigation and I got to be scared well, about that. So, so this, is, this is a really interesting and this is one of sort of the, the new view of safety, mm -hmm. safety two, safety differently. Some of that mm -hmm. thinking has been has been challenged around this is is the, the use of agentive language, mm -hmm. the language that has perhaps hidden meanings that we don't recognize but result in a perception. Mm -hmm. So the word investigation, 
Most of the time we hear the word investigation, it's probably along the lines of police investigation, CSI, New York, New York Blue, mm -hmm. whatever, whatever TV programs we watch or whatever we read in the media, be that online, paid newspapers, whatever. And it has a, it has a subtle negative connotation. And, and actually, as an industry, we've talked about investigations, accident investigations, incident investigations, and so on. We have the Air Accident Investigation Branch, which we went to visit this week, which was amazing. But, Incredible. but, but that language of investigation is reserved for when things have gone badly wrong. Mm -hmm. But in an, inside an organization, you don't investigate the things that have gone badly wrong. You are trying to investigate and learn from it. So by going back to that why, why do we do an investigation? We do that to learn. Okay. Now, there is some language out there where they call them learning reviews and learning teams, etc. And that mindset actually changes the intent and it just softens that almost subliminal negative connotation. I'm doing an investigation. I'm investigating this. Mm -hmm. I want to interview you because I'm investigating this. It can sound a little bit negative and can put people on the back feet, mm -hmm. especially when you're talking second languages. And this is one of the things, for those who English is mother tongue, mm -hmm. it doesn't have as much of an impact. You get somebody to translate in their head as you're talking, and you're talking about investigations, interviews, etc. And they're putting it in their own words in their head and translating, which is tiring enough. It's not surprising that you get different cultures and different responses. So by, by being very explicit in the positive language you use, like learning teams, yeah, it's, about, it's a learning team. I'm, I'd like to listen to you. I'm not interviewing you. I'd like to listen to your, your, your views. It's a very different connotation and it just opens up. And if you can just open up a little bit more and get people to open up a little bit more, you learn a little bit more. Mm. And then you feed back a little bit more and they see more value and they see your approach. We've had it here in the last in the last year, you know, use of flight data monitoring. Mm. It's Big Brother watching me as I'm flying my aircraft. Within six months, it's hey man, we've learned a huge amount, haven't we? This is awesome. And it takes a bit of time, you know, and some of the times I've done learning reviews, oh yeah, but you're using flight data monitoring to to, to, to follow us up. And now they're going, they're putting reports and saying, hey guys, could you check flight data monitoring because I, I'm not sure how I landed and I'd love to learn. Mm -hmm. I got a report set and I'd love to learn. And that's all based on this positive language, mm -hmm. this slight different book. So it, it's not just changing words on a page. It's, it's a belief. It's a belief that the most important thing we can do in safety is learn and improve. And if that's, if that's why you're doing everything, and you change your language that you use to reflect that better, mm -hmm. it drives a mindset mm -hmm. and it opens the door. So, so, so learning team leaders, leaders, you know, we talk about blame or, or just culture, no blame cultures, etc. But even they don't really resonate. Mm -hmm. If you ask a pilot, what's a just culture? They'll go, mm -hmm. some of them will get it, some of them don't. If you say, what's a blame culture? Oh, and, and they'll say, oh, we've got a blame culture here, etc. Mm -hmm. You go, no, we don't. If you say, what do you do if you screw up? We own up. And this is a, a phrase that I, I, I think we talked about, but you know, and I show that every single safety recurrent training, I stick up the phrase, if you screw up, we own up. Mm -hmm. Because FlexJet is interested in why, not who. Exactly. That's on the wall on, when I'm presenting. And I ask them what that means. And they, they start to share immediately because I put it in their own language and it's, it's, it's a deeper sense of uh, trust. Mm -hmm. It's not a jargon. And, and that way you get this opening up mm -hmm. and that's the opening up is the bit. And so all the language we use, the different language that we're, we're trying to introduce, it's all a sense of making people feel more comfortable to talk mm -hmm. and to recognize our why. Yeah. Safety why is to learn and improve to protect people. Once you get that kind of mindset, everything else is good. And it cultivates that environment of comfort, like you say, where you're setting them up to understand that it is more about what took place, not who did it. Because if one person can do it, everybody can do it. Yeah. I care more about what happened. That's why I love anonymous reporting. That's why I love conversations. I'll meet you on your turf. I'll go to the hangar. We'll meet the pilots where they're at. Not let me bring you into some dark, dingy interrogation room. Like you said, like we're on some yeah. you know, Hollywood show. It's an element of comfort to where we're just trying to improve the organization, not to come after somebody like some crazy witch hunt and get them out of the and, and, and that's exactly it. So, so going to visit the people in their place. Yeah. Going to visit the people in their place with the intent to learn about their job. Mm -hmm. Now we're onto something. Yeah. If you go there with the intent to find what they did wrong, yeah, they'll be quite defensive. If you go, I just want to come and see what you do every day. And I'd love to ask some questions because I'm learning about what, what happened. Um, and I'd love to learn why. 
Why do you think it happened? And what's your input? Because everybody turns up to do an awesome job every day. No one wakes up in the morning and goes, do you know what? I'm going to do a mediocre job today because I just don't give a shit. You don't get those people in aviation. No. You get people who wake up in the morning and are inspired to go to work because it's aviation. I mean, it's that. Yeah. You know, it's awesome. And, and people don't come to work to screw it up. So when you say, why do you think it went wrong? They'll probably give you a whole raft of reasons. Some of them will be perceptions. Some of them might just be that little nugget that said they got away with it, but the next person it's going to happen to is really going to bite them in the ass. Mm-hmm. And, and having that understanding and, and showing that you care because you want to learn, mm-hmm. everybody's proud of the work they do. If you, sh- if you recognize their, that pride they have in their work and you listen to their opinion, their perspective, and you value it, you will learn a load. And if you learn a load, you can protect a load. Mm-hmm. So that, that's the link. And, and I love that, as you said, you go to the hangar, you go to the cockpit, you pick, it's difficult when you've got a lot of people remote. And, you know, I don't see the pilots very often because they're here, they're yeah. everywhere. But just a little WhatsApp message saying, hey, I saw that report you submitted. Let me know when you're free for a chat. Mm-hmm. And next thing I know, my phone will be ringing saying, hey, Connor, yeah, yeah, let's talk. Um, or could you send me something? You know, that, just that interaction. You get that real positive sense because it comes from a position of care. Mm-hmm. It's not a position of, I'm, I'm chasing you, I'm following you up. Mm-hmm. It's, I care about what happened in the event you were in. How can we help stop it happening again? I'm so, approachable. doesn't matter if it's 2 a.m. If that's the time that you're available, I'm available. Yeah, and, and, and there is that, you know, that, that servant leadership. We're, exactly. you know, we, we are servants of safety. We're mm-hmm. servants of the operation. We're servants of the people in the operation. Yeah. And if you have that mindset, we're here to serve, to lead. You know, that's the British Army's motto, to serve, to lead. Mm-hmm. There's the opposite motto. That's, that's what it takes. And, and that idea of serving, serving through caring, mm-hmm. serving through listening, service through learning, that's all elements of a servant leader. Exactly. Well, I think you and I could sit here and chat, you know, until the sun completely goes down. But uh, we might have to just do another episode as always. <laughs> This is a quarterly thing. Colin, I cannot thank you enough for not only inviting me out here, but also making the time for us to sit here and record an episode as well. So thank you so much, sir. No, it's brilliant. And do you know what? This, this is where we, we get together. We think, we share. Um, I'd love to see some feedback on, on from what people think and, and yep. hear. Um, I know we had a bit of that last time, which was great. Um, but actually, this is where you start to grow that sense of integration and you share the stories of inspiring others, inspiring mm-hmm. others to care more. So the more we can do this, the more we can help other people learn and inspire. And, you know, we'll be getting together again. Don't you worry. Absolutely. Well, as he said with sharing, make sure you like, share, subscribe. This has been the Safety Wire Podcast. Thanks for tuning in.